Welcome, folks. We're just getting ready behind the scenes here. So grab a snack, a comfy blanket, and we'll be with you in just a minute.
Hi, Becky. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. Perfect. And can you see my presentation? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. All right, so thank you, Becky, for that introduction. Um, so like Becky said, uh, my name is Katie Scott. I am an education specialist with uh, Dex Unlimited Canada. Uh, so I oversee our education programs in uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, uh, and PEI as well. And I am based out of the Wetland Interpretive Centre at the Shubenacadie Provincial Wildlife Park. Yeah, and that's me there. So I'm the coordinator for the Young Naturalist Club, and I'm over in Halifax. <laughs> that's great. Um, before we get started today, I did also want to um, mention that we are streaming and also birding on um, in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral uh, territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So Becky gave a bit of an overview of what we're going to be going over. So this presentation, um, I am by no means an expert birder. I am very much a beginner myself. Um, but what I'd like to do tonight, um, well, the both of us would like to do tonight is, is kind of share our passion and, and what knowledge we have um, of birds and birding and and uh, kind of facilitate um, and encourage people to get out and uh, go explore some areas where you can participate in birding and particularly the Christmas bird counts, which she mentioned are uh, happening right now. So what is the Christmas bird count? I know if you're hearing of the Christmas bird count for the first time, that might seem kind of silly. Uh, what does Christmas have to do with birding? Well, the Christmas bird count actually is the longest running citizen science project in the world. Uh, so it was start in 1990 or sorry, uh, 1900 rather. And uh, so it is over 120 years old at this point, which is really great. And so that of course um, provides a long-term citizen science project for scientists um, to use in their data collection. And there are over 2000 locations all across the Western hemisphere that participate in these Christmas bird counts every year. And each Christmas bird count is conducted on a single day, so a 24-hour period, sometime between December 14th and January 5th. And in this takes place in within a 24-kilometer uh, diameter circle. And it's important to note that this circle is the same year to year. And usually the, the date is around the same time as well. And that's, of course, for, for comparison purposes for data collection. The counts um, are typically organized at a local or regional level. So certainly here in Nova Scotia, uh, the Nova Scotia Bird Society coordinates uh, many or all of the uh, Christmas bird counts that happen in our province. I believe there are around 27 of them. Um, and I have here some of the locations that you can check out um, that you can check out in that might be in your area. So I do know that a few of them have already happened this week, um, but there are a number that are that are coming up, including uh, this weekend. So December 19th on Saturday, we have the Shubenacadie Christmas bird count, and we're actually hosting a wetland walk at the wildlife park uh, that morning starting at 9 a.m. And there still is a registration available for that. Um, and each, I should know also that each of these regions have a coordinator. So if you go on the Nova Scotia Bird Society website, uh, you'll see this map, which is what I've where I've pulled from, and you'll see all these locations. And if you click on those red dots, it'll give you more information about each of those um, Christmas bird counts, including the name and contact information for, for the coordinator for that region. So also this weekend, there's the Woofville, the Apple River, Lewisburg, Cape Sable Island, uh, and Annapolis Royal Christmas bird counts. There's also the Yarmouth, Lockport, Halifax, and Dartmouth in Annie Ganish, which takes place on Sunday this weekend. And then the Sydney's uh, on the 21st, Eskasoni Big Pond on Boxing Day. Uh, on the 27th, we have Bedford Sackville, White Point, St. Peter's, West Hants, we have the Strait of Canso and the Pugwash Estuary on the 28th. We have Truro on the 29th, as well as Broad Cove. Uh, Bridgetown on the 30th and Pictou Harbour on January 1st. And Lunenburg on the 2nd and Chesuncook on January 5th. 
So as you can see, there are a number of locations and um, certainly we encourage you to get out to one of them if you can, and if not one, uh, maybe a couple. So the first question when you're thinking about getting out and going birding is where should I go? And um, what we're going to talk about about today is, is that's kind of the beauty behind birding is that you can see birds pretty much anywhere you go, uh, whether it's your backyard at a feeder or whether it's walking to work, even in an urban area, there are birds all around us. I think that's one of the enticing things with birding. It's, it's always a challenge and there's always opportunity around. Um, I did note that there are a few uh, Dex Unlimited wetland projects, some of my favorite sites I've just featured here that you can check out. So certainly the wetland trail at the Shubenacadie Provincial Wildlife Park, um, which is open uh, during the winter time. The trails are not maintained, um, but it's a really nice uh, walk that you can go and enjoy. There is also another trail at the Shubenacadie Wildlife Park, and that's the St. Andrews Marsh Trail. And that's actually located up uh, along the picnic uh, and playground area there. That's also a really great birding area. Um, we have Miner's Marsh for anyone who's tuning in from the valley. Of course, that's a, a well-known birding hotspot and Ducks Unlimited project there. Uh, there's also the Brookfield Wetlands uh, just off of the 102 on the way to Truro. So that's a really great pit stop. Um, there's been some kind of uh, rare birds uh, over there over over the course of a few years. Uh, I think there was the glossy ibis there a few years ago, which was really cool. And we also have a program called the Treasured Wetlands of Nova Scotia. And this is a program where each year four wetlands across Nova Scotia are designated with this status. And at each of these sites, you'll you'll find a photo post, and we encourage people to to go out to these treasured wetlands across the province, check them out, and you can also bird while you're there. And there is a website uh, listed on the screen if you'd like to check out and learn more about that program. All right, Becky, I'll hand it over to you. Great, yeah, thanks, Katie. So, the best way to get familiar with birding equipment is, of course, to get the equipment out physically and play around with it. Um, but I can give you some tips for binoculars, which are definitely an important tool to have in Nova Scotia, um, not least of which because our birds are both small and quick. So, usually when you're birding in Nova Scotia, you're looking at something that's pretty small and usually far away from you, maybe moving pretty quickly, um, or if you're lucky, staying very still and it's out in the open. But binoculars are a really useful tool for seeing the birds as if they were up close. So if you're not familiar with binoculars, um, they're not too, too complex. The first thing I like to tell people is to make sure you're choosing the right size for your face. So you can get a pretty good set of binoculars for not that much money, actually. There are some kids varieties that are um, fairly cost effective and you want to make sure that you have the right size for where your eyes are. So if you can't adjust the binoculars so that it's comfortable for both of your eyes to be looking through them at the same time, you know, those binoculars are probably too small or too big for you. So you're going to want to go a size up, size down. Um, obviously you can use kids binoculars without being a kid. That's totally fine. You just want to make sure that you're able to see well through your binoculars. And then actually using the binoculars. So there's two things that you wanna make sure you're doing when you have your binoculars out in the wild looking for birds. One is you wanna look at your target first with your bare eyes. So you're looking out across the wetland at the duck that you wanna see up close. Maybe you're looking up into a tree. You're gonna look at your target first and then lift your binoculars to your face. And the second part you wanna remember is the focus. So if the thing that you were seeing with your bare eyes, which presumably is in focus when you're looking at it with your bare eyes, if it's not in focus when you pull your binoculars up, then you have to adjust that knob. Some binoculars have that knob on top, sometimes they're by the eyepiece. You're going to adjust that until your image is a little bit clearer. And if you're finding that is really tricky to do, you might pick a different target and experiment with the focus. 
So something I like to do with my binoculars to make sure that they're working okay when I first go out and I don't have to fall back on like a backup pair of binoculars or something is I'll pick something like the top of a tree or maybe a fence post a little bit away from me and I'll get that in focus first. And then I'll pick another target, so maybe it's, that's the top of the tree then, and I'll get that in focus. Just so I'm comfortable moving the focus around, I've got an idea of how I'm supposed to be moving my binoculars to help me see. And then another good tip for your binoculars is to find a steady base. So this is particularly important if you're like me and you like watching ducks. Usually when I go duck watching, I am looking for sea ducks, like eiders or scoters, which are usually pretty far away from where I am on the beach or in a blind, and it's windy where I go birding. So I like to either anchor my elbows down on a bird blind, or sometimes I'll get right down on the ground so that I'm staying still. Otherwise, especially when you're looking really far away, you're going to be getting quite a bit of shake to your binoculars, and that's going to make it hard to identify the bird that you're looking at. So those are just some general tips for your binoculars. If you want to get really intense, you can also get eyewear that will let you see birds even closer. So there are things called scopes, which are really great for uh, sea duck watching, especially. Um, the magnification is higher. They're kind of like a very intense monocle. There's the one lens instead of the two that you have in your binocular. Uh, and you set them up usually on a tripod when you go to the beach or, or you're blind. So there's a lot of tools you can use when it comes to binoculars, scopes, and, and other, uh, other eye pieces. It's really just about trying them out and seeing what you like best. Other birding equipment that you might want to have on hand are things like field guides. I always have a couple field guides in my backpack when I go birding. My favorite one is National Geographic. But there are a whole bunch of bird guides available specifically for Nova Scotia birds. We have a Sibley's guide out here. Um, there's a Peterson's field guide, and they're all great. Um, some are a little bit simpler than others. So if you're brand new to birding and you just want maybe a couple species, you can get a bird guide that is specific just to backyard birds. Or if you want to get really intense, there are bird guides that have every single warbler in them for all of North America. <laughs> so I have a couple. You can start off small and work your way up, or you can start a whole collection right now. It depends on what you want to go see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Becky. I always love that uh, tip that you have about uh, using the binoculars backwards. That's really helpful for, say, if you find a feather or whatnot, using those binoculars as, as a magnifying glass. Yeah, so fun. <laughs> or, of course, you can always, uh, they, binoculars certainly make a great Christmas gift if you're still uh, look, needing a, another Christmas gift uh, for that hard-to-get person. So we're going to jump into identifying species. So I'm going to go over some tips and tricks on to try and help you identify species. And I can't stress enough that um, patience is key. It takes a long time to figure out how uh, how to identify birds and quickly as well, because a lot of them, as you know, are flying by. Sometimes you don't get a good look at a species. It can be very challenging. And that's one of the things that is kind of enticing about birding, but sometimes it can be frustrating as well. Um, but there are so many great resources out there, which I'm going to highlight in a minute. Um, but to go over a few of the first steps for trying to identify species, first you should consider where you're birding. So what is the habitat like around you? Are you birding in a wetland? Uh, are you birding along the coast, along the shoreline, along some mudflats? Or are you birding in an open field? So taking the location in, into consideration is the first step. And that will help you to narrow down some of the species that you would see in those areas. So, for instance, um, you know, you may see uh, a bald eagle or a northern harrier along a field. Um, or if you're along the coast, you would maybe see some shorebirds or great blue herons. If you are birding um, in the forest, then maybe you'd see some songbirds. So that's the first step is trying to identify um, the birds that would be in the area that you're that you're birding. The second piece uh, or second tip rather would be their general impression. And general impression is kind of something that's hard to explain. Um, and 
I think that this picture here of all these silhouettes kind of represents that very well. So what is the overall size of the bird? What is the overall shape? Um, the beak length, the beak size, uh, the legs, you know, are there webbed feet or are they long, long legs? So what are some of those, those main characteristics? And certainly color can also play a factor as well. So it, was it a bright red bird, like a cardinal? Or was it um, a drab kind of brown color bird, which a lot of them are, and makes it tricky to, to uh, identify? And then the third piece is, what was the bird doing? So taking notes on their behavior. So was it soaring over a field hunting? Or was it in a flock? Or was it more of a solitary species? Or what was their flight pattern? Um, sometimes you can identify a bird just based on their flight pattern. For instance, chickadees um, actually have a pretty uh, distinct flight pattern. So those are kind of the first three things that you're looking for when you first spot a bird. And some of the resources to help you get started. Um, like I said, it's all about practice practicing. Um, one of the one of the best resources I would say is is certainly the Nova Scotia Bird Society's Facebook page. Um, they there are posts there on a regular basis and and just um, being engaged with that Facebook page. Um, I know for me when I was starting out that was a very big um, help for me just to kind of see other people's pictures and and go through the reasoning as to what I did and to conclude on a certain identification. There are also um, some really great online resource, resources like the Merlin ID, where you can actually upload a photo and it gives you best suggestions. Um, iNaturalist and eBird um, do similar things as well. Um, and then they also have this uh, identification um, kind of quiz on Merlin, where you can type in, you know, where you were birding, what time of day you're birding, and some of the main characteristics, and it will give you a list of, of possible uh, birds to help you narrow it down. All right, so now we're going to go into some of the common species, and certainly this part of the presentation that it could have been uh, a few hours long, but I tried to narrow it down. So my first slide here is about some of our common feeder species. So you're probably familiar with some of these species as is. Um, so of course our blue jay, one of our most common, common species that we have here year round. Uh, they're a little bit larger than the robin and certainly have that bright blue coloration. Uh, we have the black cap chickadee, and these guys are are distinct from their cheeseburger sound. That cheeseburger, cheeseburger. That's a little trick I like to um, teach kids when they're listening for for bird calls. And of course, they say chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. And uh, another interesting note: there is another species, uh, the boreal chickadee. And we have those in Nova Scotia as well. Uh, they're a little bit more elusive uh, and harder to spot, um, but certainly black cap chickadees, you know, are, are our most common. We also have the dark eyed junco, which is another common feeder bird. They're dark gray on their backs with the white underside. And they have typically a, a pink bill. And um, when, they, when they're flying away, you can kind of see two on either side, a white, tail feathers flash open. So those are some of our common feeder birds. All right. So here are our tricky, tricky sparrows. To this day, sparrows are probably my nemesis. Um, they are, they're all very, very similar and have subtle differences. So this, and I think probably that's another reason why I love birding so much is because I'm always learning and uh, there's always a new challenge, it seems. And these sparrows are certainly one of my challenges. Uh, so one of our most common sparrows is the song sparrow. And they're tan to brown, have a white breast and have those streaks all down the side. Uh, their main char identify identifying characteristic sorry, is that dot in the center of their breast. And they're commonly seen in places where there's um, kind of thickets, marshes, or even along the roadsides. Another sparrow species that we have is the white-throated sparrow. 
And uh, you can see here it has that white throat, but it also has that kind of distinct uh, yellow above its beak and above its eye. And certainly another tricky thing with bird identification is that this um, this look kind of changes throughout the year. So we also have their non-breeding plumage, which is definitely more drab in color. And then we have, of course, the juvenile versus the female versus the male. So there's all differences within a species as well. And third there, we have our swamp sparrow. So they typically have more of a rusty head uh, and rusty color feathers with those gray cheeks uh, and a white throat. So they're commonly found, of course, near wetlands and in the cattails. And these are just three of our sparrow species that I've mentioned here. Um, there are several <laughs> sparrow species that we have that frequent Nova Scotia. Um, so you can look into that more in your field guides. Katie, do you know what sounds these different sparrows make? That's, That's a, a good, good question, question, Becky, and they all have very subtle differences in their songs, but I'm actually not the best at birding by ear, so if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, well, I actually don't know the song sparrow or swamp sparrow that well. I do know our white-throated sparrow is the one that sings, is it Oh Sweet Canada? That's, That's right, right. yes. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know the other ones very well. They're tricky, and they're also, like, very similar, I guess, to their um, the different looks they can have. Birds have different mm -hmm. kinds of calls, too. So sometimes there's like a fish or a chip sound, and sometimes there's an actual song. Sparrows are very tricky. Yeah, that's right. And and birding by ear is a whole nother skill in itself as well. It's one th another thing that I'm uh, still working on. And I'm going to play some sounds a little bit later on in the presentation uh, for some prizes as well. All right. Um, so, of course, uh, I have to mention our waterfowl species. So waterfowl, um, are, they're typically divided into two categories. So those are the divers and the dabblers. So what is a dabbler? So this actually refers to how they feed. So our dabbling ducks are the ones that, um, like you'll see mallards or, um, or wood ducks, they'll stick their head underwater and, um, Kind of dabble in the water so they'll that's how they feed so they feed just under the water surface feeding on things like small in, aquatic insects and uh plants versus our dive, divers sorry so our divers include those species like the common eider that you see on the right hand side so those species are diving down typically of course in deeper water typically more coastal birds um to get uh, say things like fish or um, crabs to eat. So I've, there are, of course, many different species of waterfowl that frequent Nova Scotia. And just a few here that I pulled would be the most common one would be our mallard or sometimes called the green head. Um, the male and the female look very different. So sometimes uh, that's confusing for people. And the mallard, the, the drake or the, or the male, is the one with the green head. And then the female is the one that is more drab uh, in color. And that's, of course, so that um, in the springtime when it's nesting, the female can sit on, on the nest and be camouflaged and hide her, her ducklings. And just like, of, of course, other birds, they also have uh, different plumage. So juveniles, again, look different. Um, and then they have their non-breeding and breeding plumage, just to make it that much trickier. Um, I included a picture here of the American black duck, and that's because the, the black duck can often look very similar to the female mallard or the hen mallard. Um, the main difference between those two um, is that the, the speculum or the secondary feathers on the wings. So on the black duck here, you can see there's just black that is surrounding that patch of blue, which is the speculum on the wing. Whereas the mallard, the mallard has that as well, but there's actually a white uh, line above and below that blue patch. 
So that's kind of one of the defining characteristics between the mallard hen and then the American black duck. And of course, the American black duck is, is typically darker overall than the female mallard is as well. And of course, there are a lot of uh, other diver ducks, um, but I just had uh, the common eider here. So there are, of course, characteristics by that kind of long wedge-shaped bill that they have. And uh, they're, the males are very kind of bright white with that black um, look. And the females, of course, are, again, kind of drab brown colors. And they're certainly uh, a coastal bird. We there is another species of, of eider called the king eider, which is really cool, and they have a, a bright uh, colors on their bill, and that's kind of a more rare species to Nova Scotia. All right, and then we're going to get into some of our birds of prey. So again, I just uh, have a few examples here. So we have our, our great horned owl, one of several owl species that frequent Nova Scotia. And of course they're characterized by those uh, ear tufts they're called that they have on their that they have on their head. And they're really kind of brown and have lots of streaking. And that's of course to make sure that they're nice and camouflage in, in the woods. And of course they are nocturnal um, and I have, uh, I'm going to show in a little bit, I have a, a taxidermy great horned owl here with me. Um, some of the other sp species of owls that we have in Nova Scotia are the barred owl, another common one, and the saw wet owl, which is a really small owl. And even though they're all fairly common, of course, they're very hard to spot. They're only out at night and they're very elusive. So it can be very hard and challenging to, to find an owl. So then we have our red-tailed hawk, um, again, one of several hawk species that we have in Nova Scotia. And this one is actually one of our uh, more common and widespread hawks that we have. And of course, they have that characteristic red tail, which is where they got their name. I find it actually, um, I rely more on their the streaking that they have on their chest to identify them by. Because often when you're seeing a hawk, it's soaring in the air. So you're seeing its underside. Whereas the red-tailed hawk, it's actually the upper side of the tail that is is red, more red, rusty colored. So often when you see a hawk, you can't really see that red tail unless say it's perched on, you know, a telephone wire or a tree. So I actually more often rely on seeing that streaking that's on its chest. And it's kind of like a belly band that goes across it. And that's um, a fairly reliable uh, identification indicator of the red-tailed hawk versus some of the other hawks, um, like the Cooper's hawk and other hawks that we have in Nova Scotia. And then lastly, we have, of course, one of our uh, poster <laughs> poster birds, the bald eagle. And this is one of the lar largest birds of prey that we have in Nova Scotia. And an interesting thing about these ones, of course, they're mostly characterized by that white head and that white tail, um, but they actually don't develop these uh, white feathers until they're about four or five, six years of age. Um, so often we'll have people uh, see the juvenile bald eagle and sometimes uh, they get mistaken for a golden eagle, um, which is definitely more rare in Nova Scotia. Um, so that's just a, a note that sometimes you might see the juvenile phase of a bald eagle, um, but it is actually a bald eagle. And they're um, not necessarily great hunters, but they're really great scavengers as well. That's why you often see them hanging out um, by the side of the road um, or farms even. All right. So I'm going to go over just a couple more. Um, I threw these ones in here because they're some of the most challenging uh, <laughs> but also common species that we have. So here is a great picture from uh, of a downy and a hairy woodpecker. 
So the downy and the hairy look very, very similar, as you can see. Um, the main difference, of course, is their size. So the downy is much smaller. It's only about six and a quarter inches uh, versus the hairy, which is about the size of a robin, so about nine inches in length. Um, both of these are very, very common in Nova Scotia. And um, the other identifying characteristic is that the downy has a shorter bill than the hairy. Not only is it shorter, but you can kind of tell the body length to beak length ratio. So it's only about a third of that of the, um, of the hairy for the downy. And of course, you can tell the males and the females um, because the, the males will have that red patch at the back of their head uh, versus the females, which don't have that. And I, I still to this day find that downy versus hairy is still challenging for me. It's much easier when you see them side by side, such as in this picture. But, um, you know, certainly if they're visiting your, your feeder or they're in the woods and you see them, it can be kind of challenging when you don't see them side by side. All right, so another um, couple of uh, species that are very difficult to tell apart. I mean, to some people it, it might be easier, but I still, to again, to this day, find that uh, ravens and crows are still a challenge for me sometimes. And again, it often comes down to size. So, of course, ravens are much bigger. Um, I was going to include some real pictures, but I thought that this uh, cartoon captured it much better. Um, and this is from one of my favorite uh, comics, which is birdedmood.com. Um, so the common raven, of course, is much bigger versus the crow, which is a lot smaller. Um, the raven also has this kind of wedge or shovel shaped or spade shaped tail versus the crow, which has more of a fanned shape tail and of course the raven has more um well here they call them long fancy throat <laughs> feathers uh which is basically what they are um but more feathers on the beak as well and their sounds are a bit different so i'm gonna see if i can play um the two different calls and i think that will help um be a bit more clear for people so just bear with me I think once I play them, you'll understand what I mean. So this here is a crow. And I'm gonna play the raven. So it's more of a croaking sound versus the cawing sound. <laughs> and uh, Becky, I thought you'd appreciate that last uh, bit of comic there, the the barrel rolls that <laughs> that the crows uh, want to be able to do but can't. I do love that as somebody who has been dive bombed by robins <laughs> or robins ravens. It's really uh, relatable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now, um, Becky, if I could get you to moderate the chat on YouTube, I'm going to, this is our first time doing this, so we'll see if this works. Yeah, so this is your chance, folks, if you're following along in the chat, which depending on how you have your YouTube set up, could be down at the bottom or over at the right, you can uh, guess the sounds that Katie's going to play here. You can just type them right into the chat. Okay, um, Becky, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. So what I have here are some Audubon birds, and these are actually kind of like stuffed animal birds that you can, um, they have the actual uh, bird call. So I'm going to just do a couple here. And so the first person who answers in the chat in YouTube, uh, I'm going to send uh, one of our field guide, Ducks Unlimited field guides, which is called Marsh World, and a ducks poster. So, this is our first one. All 
right. What mm-hmm. do you guys think? You can type it into the chat there. You want to try it again, Katie? Yeah. Let me know if we have anyone typing in there. How specific do they have to be, Katie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we'll, we'll give, give it, it to them if it's not that specific. All right. Well, it looks like Diana Stead. I hope I got your last name right. You said duck first. Oh, perfect. You know what? I'll take it. It is a duck. That's right. So this is, uh, of course, our mallard duck. Um and that's their uh, traditional quack call, right? So, Diana, I'll connect with you and uh, get you your prize pack. I do have one or two others that I wanted to do as well. Yeah, so, folks, so if you end up winning, you can either reach out directly via email to either Katie or I. I'll put that, both of our emails in the chat here. We'll make sure that we connect and you can get your prize in the mail. All right, here's my next one. This one's definitely more of a challenge. Yeah, that's a tricky one. What do you guys think? I'll give you a hint. Um, It has red on its head. I'll give you another hint. It likes to peck on trees. <laughs> well, some good guesses here, but not the right answer yet. What are some of the guesses? We have blue jay and mm. hawk. Oh, mm-hmm. Tony says woodpecker. Yeah, I'll give it to you. That's right. It's a woodpecker. And this one here is actually a pileated woodpecker. Um, so that's right. Perfect. <laughs> nice job, Tony. Awesome. So I'll connect with them and get them their identifications, uh, their field guides and their identification posters. Um, yeah, these little Audubon birds are some of my favorite things. I use them for education props. Um, and uh we have them for sale in our gift shop at the wildlife park as well. Um, but you can get them online as well. They're fairly inexpensive. All right. So Becky, I think that's about it from me on common species. So I'll hand it back over to you. Oops. Hold on. For the eBird portion. Yeah. So I, I'm very much addicted to both eBird and iNaturalist now um, as somebody who spends a lot of time outside and who likes keeping lists. Um, eBird and iNaturalist are uh, they're quite similar. eBird is specific to birds, of course, which is why we're going to talk about it in uh, tonight's presentation. But essentially, they are tools that allow you to keep a list of what you're seeing when you go out. Uh, as well as uh, submit those sightings to research efforts around the world. So eBird is actually really cool for that reason, for many reasons, I guess. But I find it really cool because there are so many people using it that eBird actually produces some really great quality data for avian scientists uh, all over the world, here in Canada and into the States and in Mexico. Obviously, all three of us share bird populations, but uh, eBird is big everywhere. Um, So in this picture here, um, I used uh, eBird on my desktop more often than I do my my phone app, but you can use it on either your phone or your desktop. This picture here is from my desktop, and all I did was zoom into Nova Scotia under the Explore section. So something that I really like eBird on the desktop for is it's good for narrowing down where you might want to go birding because you can look at other people's eBird lists. So if you notice in all along Maine and especially in southern Nova Scotia, uh, also in Halifax there, if you know where those places are on our map, you're seeing you know orange to red spots. There's more birds there. 
And there's more birds there for a few reasons. I mean, southern Nova Scotia is incredibly diverse, great birding area. And then in Halifax, of course, we have a whole lot of people and a lot of them are e-birding. So, yes, yeah, so these are what we call hotspots in eBird. They're places where you can see a lot of bird lists. Um, and I guess indirectly, you can see a lot of birds as well. Um, so this is something I use eBird for quite a bit, actually, is I go in and I just see what's going on with the lists from day to day. And that's how I direct my birding. Katie, if you want to go to our next slide here, it actually zooms in even just a little more uh, into where I am in Halifax. So in Halifax, I mean, we're... You know, not urban compared to, say, Toronto, but we do have uh, some urban space uh, on the peninsula here. And in the park spaces, you can see we have some hot spots um, that are comparable, I suppose, to some other areas of the province, you know, a little more rural, where you might be seeing different ducks. Uh, one that you see probably right away um, out at the end of the city there, that's Heartland Point out by the golf course. That's a really great birding spot, um, both for inland birds, um, those sparrows that we were talking about earlier, as well as sea ducks because you're out at the point there. Um, you might also recognize Point Pleasant Park in this map. It's one of the orange little, uh, little segments there at the end of the Halifax Peninsula. Uh, and there's also some, some pretty warm spots out Chesapeake Way, Muscadabit Harbor, um, and then up and towards Bedford as well. So obviously there's a lot of birders in Halifax. So what I like to do when I go into eBird is I'll click these, I'll see what's going on throughout the day. Because there are so many people in Halifax, you can get a new eBird list, especially for Heartland Point, for Point Pleasant, almost every day, definitely every week during breeding season. Um, and a lot during the Christmas bird count. So if you're new to birding, you're not really sure where to go, eBird is a great place to uh, to check out and see see what's going on where. You go to our next slide there, Katie. I can tell you a bit more about how I uh, how I use how I submit information to eBird. So like I said, this is the desktop viewer for eBird, um, which is where I like to use it. I do also have an app on my phone. So the phone app I find is pretty good for submitting data. It's not as good for exploring data around you, but definitely if you're out for a walk with your friends and you want to submit something, maybe you've gone birding for an afternoon, you want to keep a list, um, the app is great. You can set it on. Um, it'll track the course that you're walking if that's what you want it to do. Uh, it'll also take time for you. It'll geolocate. It's pretty pretty powerful tool. I've just zoomed in here to Point Pleasant Park so you can see those lists that I'm talking about. So Point Pleasant Park has a lifetime of 208 species and a little over 2,000 checklists. So a lot of birding going on here. And if you keep going, Katie, we can actually go into those so you can see in a bit more detail what people are seeing. So when you submit your data, this is what you're contributing it to. So you can see, so I took this, I think I took it on the 15th actually, this screenshot here. And that day, there were uh, there were some sightings of some black ducks, some herring gulls. Um, there's also some older sightings there. Uh, something that's really nice about eBird is that you get a concise list. So anytime a bird has been reseen or a species has been reseen, the totals just update here. So if you know tomorrow somebody sees more American black ducks, they're going to submit them, and that's just going to to update the count here. So a pretty powerful tool. And if Katie keeps going further, you'll see how we can submit them. So you can submit checklists through the desktop as well. That's usually what I do when I'm birding through work. So this is the Young Naturalist Club's um, eBird profile. So I'll go in here, I'll click you know, Submit New Checklist. This is just an overview of what we've done um, in the last year or so. Uh, and if you click on the next slide, Katie, I think it brings up a... Uh, yeah, so this is where you can actually submit your observations on the desktop. So the first thing it'll do, no matter where you're submitting your data, if you're submitting um, or you're keeping a list on your phone or if you're keeping a list on the desktop, uh, it's going to ask you where you are. And then it's going to ask you for some information about how you're birding. So you can see here I have some locations saved that I bird at quite a bit with the Young Naturalist Club. So it has those saved for me. I can select one of those and then I click continue and it takes me on to the next screen, which will ask me for location info. 
So the reason they ask you for these things before you compile your list is because they want to know how to use the data. So, I mean, you can keep a birding list in any way, right? You know, if you're just birding for the sake of learning, a paper list is also completely fine. Um, I like eBird just because there are so many great learning tools there as well. But paper is absolutely fine. You can write your list inside of your field guide. You can circle them. But yeah, the reason they ask you for these questions is because there's a difference in the data between, you know, if you're traveling and birding, if you're staying in one spot, maybe doing point counts for like seabirds, um, or maybe your birding is incidental. Maybe you were just driving down the road and you noticed a bird that was kind of unusual for that area. So you, you took note of it and put it into eBird. They need to know that information if they're going to contribute it to science efforts. We keep going there, Katie. I think we got so another great thing about eBird, and this is true of both the phone app and the desktop, is it'll suggest birds for you based on where you are, which I find particularly helpful. Um, I think maybe because I'm a little bit overexcited when I go birding, and sometimes they see something and I think, oh my god, it's a European something or other, and it's not. <laughs> It's something else, uh, which, is, which is much more common. Um, so eBird, when you submit your information, so first of all, when you open up, you know, this is what I saw, it gives you this list of suggestions. The waterfowl tend to come up first. So if we were to scroll here, it would show you a whole bunch more families of birds. You can type in the number that you saw. You can also put in notes for, you know, how many males versus females you saw, what kinds of behaviors they were doing, um, you know, if there's mating activity going on, if there's breeding, nesting, those kinds of things. Um, but something that's funny about eBird and useful about eBird, you know, is if you do see something really interesting or really rare, uh, like last year, I think, what did I submit? I think it was a gross beak or something out of season. Anyway, so I ended up getting an email from eBird saying, are you sure about this one? <laughs> Um, so eBird will actually tell you when you submit things that are uncommon for the time period or uncommon for your geographic area, um, and it'll flag those, which is really interesting because, of course, researchers want to know why rare birds are showing up, but it's also a really useful learning tool for people like me who aren't that familiar with rare birds and would like to learn more about them. And it's definitely very exciting when you get that follow-up email saying, we used your sighting of that odd bird in our research. So yeah, so eBird is a really cool tool. I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, like I said, you can use it on a desktop. You can use it on your app. It's really easy to set up an account, and it's a great way to keep track of the birds you're seeing. Mm -hmm. All right. So thanks, Becky, for that. Um, eBird is kind of uh, uh, really gets really competitive too. You and with yourself, I know you know trying to get as many bird spottings that you can in a certain time frame or in a certain area. Uh, again, it's just one of the a challenge, another challenge that you can do with birding, and that eBird documents it for you. Um, so just uh, a note before we head off, so I hope that this webinar has provided you with some tips and tricks on how to get outside and get birding. Um, hopefully um, we give you a bit of a rundown on eBird and hopefully that uh, will allow you to make your own account and, and start and get out and go birding. Um, just a couple of notes, we do, or sorry, the Young Naturalist Club has travel bursaries that are available for families. Um, whether you need a fuel card or transit ticket uh, to get out and go burning around spots around the province. So you can connect with Becky and the Young Naturalist Club on their Facebook page to learn more about that. And then there's um, a number of Christmas bird counts, like we mentioned, happening all around the province. So there is uh, our Christmas bird count for kids happening out in uh, Shubenacadie at the Wildlife Park this weekend. Um, but certainly connect with your regional coordinator. And again, you can find all that information on the Nova Scotia Bird Society Facebook page or and their website, rather. Um, and last but not least, you can check out those uh, Treasured Wetlands of Nova Scotia sites that I talked a bit, uh, a bit about earlier um, and go birding at those sites so we can uh, learn more about those sites and what species are being spotted there. Um, and we also have a, a land monitoring program with Jackson Limited where you can volunteer to um, go out and 
visit some of our properties or our partner properties and again record that information about some of the observations that you've made during your visit uh, whether it's species that you were spotting or um, any kind of uh, I guess, um, like garbage that's at the site that might need some maintenance or might need some cleanup. So it's a, it's a great way to, to volunteer and get connected as well. So that's it for us. So again, thank you guys all for, for tuning in to our uh, a webinar. Again, I hope we equipped you with some uh, cool tips and tricks to get you outside. And um, don't forget to reach out to uh, your regional coordinator for the Christmas breakout. Yeah, and uh, Diane, Diana and Tony there, make sure you send an email to kscott at ducks.ca. It's in the chat there, k underscore scott. We'll connect about your prize. Uh, our websites are both there uh, to learn more about you know, the Treasured Wetlands Program. You can also find out more about the Bird Society. Uh, both of us are partners there. Um, so lots more information on our websites. You can also follow us on Facebook. Yeah, and thank you so much for, for virtually coming out. Katie and I are just going to pop back behind the scenes here and we'll stop our stream. Have a great weekend, everybody. Stay dry out there.